Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program as we continue now into our 21st season. I'm not 100% sure that this was uh, Mother Angelica's dream that we'd be going this long, but I think uh, with her continued prayers, uh, both for the network as well as for this program, we continue to see men and women who were drawn by the Holy Spirit to discover the beauty of Christ in His church. So thank you for joining us on this program. Our guest tonight is Carl Lowenstein. Uh, it's neat that he's a guest on this program. It wasn't planned this way, but he uh, has got some baseball in his background. We'll find out in a little bit. He's a former Lutheran, but this is the last week of, uh, of the regular baseball season. So it's uh, uh, fortuitous that he's on the program. Carl, welcome thank you, Marcus. to the Jerry Home. Be here. It's great to, to have you here, and I'm anxious to hear your story because I... Uh, not long ago, watched a big series on baseball that many of you may have seen, a 11 part series on the history of baseball. It's fascinating. So I'm, I'm anxious to hear you're part of that, Carl. Well, so. thank you. Yeah, it's right. good to be here. Well, I'll get out of the way and okay. invite you to start us off. Well, um, you know, basically uh, born and raised in Cincinnati, and uh, we grew up Presbyterian um, pretty much the uh, holiday uh, type of uh, church attendance, you know, Christmas, Easter. And uh, then I became married to my wife, Gail. And uh, so for all your childhood and pretty, also kind pretty, of a nominal Presbyterian. Nominal base. Presbyterian would be a good, a, a good way to, do, to describe it. Our, was, was God even a part of your life, or would you say, uh, from your consciousness? I mean, yeah. as as a, yes, it was, but yeah. uh, it just uh, you know we weren't there every Sunday. Yeah. There were other things that we did, but we we certainly had a a, a loving, kind, and and godly family. Yeah. But it wasn't uh, prayer based or anything like that. It was kind of more casual. And uh, then I married my wife, Gail, and uh, her family were very strong into the Lutheran faith. And so I became a Lutheran and uh, enjoyed being Lutheran for a long time. And um, then, so making the switch over from Presbyterianism to Lutheranism wasn't a big deal for no, you. No, it, it yep. wasn't a big deal. Um, I think the biggest um, change for me was that I started attending the Lutheran Church more regular hmm. uh, than as a young person, and uh, you know, we go every Sunday and and. Uh, do all try to be in as many. I did a Bible study there, a Bible study group on Monday uh, with a great bunch of guys, and so became more attached to the church and became God became certainly more important in my life. And I started to understand more about God and the Bible through the, the Bible study. We had a a wonderful group, and uh, so it and the Lutherans are a little more liturgical than the Presbyterian back. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, then it. Uh, so I had no idea about changing as a Lutheran. I had many good friends, and no problem with uh, the Lutheran faith. And uh, I was uh, in my job. I was down to watch the Miami, Mar Miami Marlins play a baseball game. Had you already been a, 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 a scout for right, years? Right, I had uh, uh, been a scout for quite a while now. And uh, I was, my early days as a scout, um, I was scouting high schools and colleges um, to see if those players could go on to the to the next level. 
And uh, in fact, I don't mean to interrupt you again, but I'm just curious how a scout gets started. Were you yourself well, big in baseball as a young man, or was that? I played. I played a lot of baseball, but uh, unfortunately, when you don't play very good, it's <laughs> there are other avenues, and that kind of, you know, I, I was I was consider myself a good baseball player, and uh, but then when you start going up to the different levels. Uh, you quickly see that yeah. you're you're probably going to be left behind, and maybe you have to do <laughs> something else. And uh, to stay in professional baseball was for me a chance to scout yeah. and still be in the game and and contribute. So that's pretty much how I how I got into the the scouting part and. You know, so, but the answer to the question is I wasn't, I wasn't a good enough player. That's, <laughs> that's the best answer. And uh, so I, I got into scouting. I started with the Phillies, um, and I worked there for, you know, five, five seasons, five years. Then went with the Dodgers and stayed there for 35, and now serve as a consultant for the Pirates. Okay. So. Uh, did you always, you know, you didn't always uh, live out of Cincinnati then, so you... you I grew up in Cincinnati, uh, right. uh, moved to Nashville because uh, it was it was a way to get home more often because I, I was in an area where, you know, I was in Louisiana, Mississippi, and places like that, and, yeah. and I could get home once in a while when I lived in Nashville. And then when I... Um, went with the Dodgers, my area changed and they asked me to move back to Cincinnati so I could work out of the major league ballpark there. Okay. Because I gradually uh, quit doing the high school and college and became a pro scout, which is um, working for the general manager. And um, when we make trades or uh, free agents, uh, they, they would come to me or the, another mm -hmm. scout who was doing particular teams and say, you know, we're thinking about trading for this guy. Uh, they're offering this, is, do we want to take what they're offering or is there something else that we should ask for? And that's pretty much how it went. So, so your job was going to baseball games? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Every, and it was, you know, um, it's a long season. It's, yeah. it's a, you know, you, you, and and my my children and my family uh, sacrificed so much yeah. for for the baseball because you know it's it's um, thirty thirty days spring training. You get home for two, and then uh, mm -hmm. it's opening day, and you go to. You go to St. Louis for five or six games, and then you're off to Kansas City for five or six, and it's getting home about once or twice a month. Yeah. The season ends, and then I went to winter baseball in Puerto Rico, and winter, then the winter meetings, and by the time the winter meeting's over, it's pretty much Christmas time, and spring training's right around oh, okay. the corner. So. <laughs> And you're not even paying attention to who's winning the game. You're looking at the guy. Exactly, right? exactly. Sometimes I don't even know the score <laughs> when it when it ends. But uh, you're looking you're looking at uh, their abilities, their tools, and the big thing is uh, when you get at the major league level, you have to are they a good fit? Do they fit with what your team makeup is right now? Got to be a little bit of a detective to to try to, to try to find out about uh, personalities and things of that nature. Good teammates, bad teammates. Well, and as you mentioned in our dis brief discussion before the program, that uh, depending on who owns and runs the team, it's a whole different family. Right. The team, which it kind of explains why you can see some player who doesn't do well for one team. Mm -hmm doesn't seem to, like he's going to be worth much, mm -hmm. quote, to use that phrase, gets traded to another team and is unbelievably it's great. Right. It's a setting in the family. That's right? exactly right. And it's, 
it's, you know, there's a lot of uh, statistics and things like that that have uh, come into the game now. And unfortunately, uh, the game is losing a little bit of its um, hands-on contact, uh, personal, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's become a business. Yeah. So, although I remember statistics when I was a kid, I'd have those cards right. and I'd look at all the, you know, their runs batted in, and right. you know, we, we we judged people on those cards. You right. Know, and what That's they said. exactly right. Right. All right. So you uh, you're married and you're a scout and you what, now you said you end up going to Miami. Well, I that's where my that's where my journey started. Uh, I went to Miami to see the Miami Marlins. Don't even remember. Uh, who they're playing, but uh, it was Good Friday. So um, I was Lutheran, so I looked in the phone book, and usually for a, a seven o'clock major league game, I have to be there at four o'clock to watch batting practice and try to do the different things that, that we have to do for for a big league game to get prepared. and. Um, I called the Lutheran Church knowing that probably their service would be in the evening and I wouldn't be able to attend, but I, I called anyhow and she said, no, the, the Friday service is going to be later on. So I hung up the phone, I asked her where the church was located and it was located very close to the hotel where I was staying. So I just decided to, uh, I was going to walk to the Lutheran Church and uh, do my praying on my own because I couldn't make the Friday, the Good Friday service. And uh, I went to open the door and the door was locked. And I couldn't get in to, and, and I walked back and, uh, you know, I felt bad, Good Friday, I should, you know, I'll, I'll do it in my room if I have to, but uh, it made me kind of realize what church is usually has their doors open all the time. And that started a, a fire in me thinking about the Catholic Church and, um, had you ever thought about the Catholic Church no, growing up? No, never. Never had a, never had a, I, I lived in a, the community I grew up in was a, a large Catholic community, but I had never had any yeah. reason to, to think about uh, becoming a Catholic. And uh, then uh, I started watching w, EWTN the shows and the mass, <laughs> and uh, our guest is Carl Lowenstein. Um, you know, I, I know you you didn't uh, be brought up thinking about the Catholic Church, but it's also one thing to start watching EWTN or watching Catholic things. Was there any anti-Catholicism in you at all, or just no thought of the church at all? Um, I'd say it was more just no no thought in my mind about the Catholic Church. Yeah, okay. Um, and... So you, when you see EWTN, did you just think it at first is just a Christian station, or do you recognize there's a difference here? I recognize it, I recognize the difference because um, the the mass in, intrigued me. Hmm. It truly intrigued me. And I quickly learned in, in the few programs that I watched that the Eucharist was going to be the, the most focused part of this mm. uh, of this service and I it just started to touch my heart um, I guess you know I'm, I'm a convert but I really love the architecture uh, the old ways of the old Catholic Church. I was uh, in Houston. I stayed. I used to stay right across the street um, from the ballpark, and there's a Catholic Church right there. And uh, I'd, I'd go to daily mass there. And uh, 
they were still doing the the mass with the priest with his back to the yeah. congregation and I, I mean it was it really appealed to me and mm. it, it really appealed to me did you have to go through any theological uh, juggling when you went from both Presbyterian then Lutheran then the Catholic uh, no no I just uh, I don't know. I don't know what it is. You know, um, the Presbyterian and the Lutheran were were, were fine, but it was uh, they were just going to church. It wasn't a special feeling that I had when I went to mass. Yep. So I had that special feeling there that I didn't have in either one or the others prior in my life. So that, that sense of uh, the presence of Christ. Right. And uh, we've had many guests on the program that have talked about having that sense, that feeling, and not sure what it is until mm -hmm. they realize, well, maybe it's the presence of Christ there in the Eucharist, Blessed Sacrament. And uh, So when did you first go to your first actual Mass? I mean, you... you, you, um, uh, you know, I went through the RCIA, and uh, did all that and uh, then my first you know actual mass was you know after I was taken into the church and uh, the, the, the beauty of of my job was that uh, I was in so many different cities all the time I got to see so many beautiful Catholic churches and different priests and different church families, you know, from, uh, you know, like I said, in Houston, uh, I'd go to St. Louis and there was a old Catholic church right under the arches in St. Louis. Oh, right. To, yes. the, yeah. to the beautiful churches in Montreal when Montreal had a baseball team there. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, it was, and I w during my career, I made it a habit to go to daily mass every every day. Uh, during my baseball career, I, I don't think I missed because I wanted yeah. to have that um, experience, and it was just great being in different churches and with different people, and it it it, it blessed me in my faith. That's for sure. When you look back on your journey from Presbyterian to Lutheran to Catholic, um, what would you say, becoming a Catholic, how has it helped you draw closer to our Lord Jesus? Um, I think that, uh, again, I go, I go back to the Eucharist, and uh, it just, uh, when, even when I take the, the Eucharist uh, today, uh, it just, there's a special fire in you. Yeah. And uh, I, the, the sacraments have made a lot of difference. I, uh, I really enjoy and appreciate reconciliation. Um, I've tried to make it a big part of my life. I've tried to be guess because I need it so much that uh, but I've I, I enjoy the feeling after I've confessed I enjoy that feeling and that fire that's in my heart to to leave there and, and uh, know that I'm forgiven and try to do better and so I see the sacraments the Eucharist all made a difference for me you know, often we hear this struggle with uh, people living out their faith on other days than Sunday. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, there's daily mass for Catholics, but also in your work. Mm -hmm. And an awful lot of us see baseball players when they get up there to the plate, they cross themselves. So uh, talk a bit, if you would, about the presence of Catholicism in Major League Baseball. Uh, it's um, probably one of the uh, highlights of being in baseball and being Catholic. Um, I had a friend who, uh, he lives in Washington now, his name was Ray McKenna. 
and Ray started the group uh, Catholic, Catholic Athletes for Christ. And uh, we, he started out on a meager budget uh, with not a lot going, going for him. And during the winter meetings, um, he would actually uh, come and stay in my room because he didn't have the funds to, to be at the winter meetings and try to mix with the baseball people. But basically what Ray did and, and his group, they, there's 30 major league teams in baseball. And through Ray's efforts, there is now 26 teams in Major League Baseball that offer mass every Sunday or Saturday to make the Major League players in Major League parks. And uh, you know, Marcus, that was that's a that's a great accomplishment because you know uh, baseball is old school, and you had that you have the baseball chapel and. And now you're trying to uh, come into this, quote, old school type situation mm -hmm. and have priests coming in. But, you know, we, we weren't, Ray wasn't trying to do, outdo, um, you know, the baseball chapel. He was trying to say, look, you know, the Eucharist is such a strong part for a Catholic that, that we like to, and so he did, he accomplished that. And uh, I was kind of glad to, to be at the uh, start of that with Ray and to see where he came from and provide that for major league players. And to see a major league player, uh, I was in Detroit one day, daily mass. Um, I walk in, look around, and here's the general manager of the Detroit Tigers and his son, Alex Avila, uh, both on their knees, praying in a oh. Catholic mass. Uh, it's, it's great to see. Well, and of course, the, I don't know what, when you were there at Detroit, but the, there had a coach named Jim Leland, whose brother's a priest. That's yeah. right, yeah. Jimmy, Jimmy, I'm very, uh, <laughs> when I was inducted into uh, what was called Baseball Legends, uh, that year, Jimmy Leland was uh, selected as a manager uh, that year. So yeah. well, Jimmy and I go back, and, yeah. and I think his brother might, may have been, you know, they're from Perrysburg, right. and there's a that's church up there my named right? St. Rose, I think. Well, that's where I went last week. My okay. mother, that's where mother entered the church, beautiful, right? Beautiful church. It is. Beautiful right. church. And Father Leland was a pastor there. Yes. Many years, yes. And uh, you know, there's also uh, there was a manager for the Dodgers uh, from Hamilton, Ohio, Jim Tracy. Uh, Jim managed the, the Dodgers and the Pirates in Colorado, and his dad's brother, um, his son was Monsignor Joe. So uh, <laughs> there are there are a lot of. Catholicism in baseball, and uh, like I said, it's to have this group and to have this going on is just, it's 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 a it's a good thing, and and Ray just did a wonderful job. Yeah, when you watch that um, series on baseball, of course, the the director of it had as an as all writers and directors might have, they have a a point they want to make by the mm -hmm. series, but one thing it did point out is that in the history of baseball in America, the, the sport went through rough times. In the early days, it was often so competitive and brutal, you know, like with Ty right. Cobb and the whole gang. It was right. a different world, but it, it did seem like that the Christianity over the years had a big impact on the players and the sport and, and the honor of the game. And then, of course, then another thing changed in it, and that's the business right. of, of the sport, which has had an effect on it over the years. But, you know, I, 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 I see changes, but, you know, I also, I also see players who, you know, you could see them on the business side, and you know, but, a lot of players, they just don't, they, 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 they always go back 
to what makes them yeah. feel secure. And so I see a, I see a lot of that in, in still in baseball. And it's, it's so refreshing to see a player uh, express his faith, uh, you know, sometimes unseen where you're in the bowels of a ballpark and we're having the mass and uh, to see the players that, that are there and their faith is, you see that you see them get away from the, the business side. It, it would seem to me to make all the difference in the world whether you recognize that your great gifts to play baseball are of the Lord or of you. That's right. That that's. I mean, and you look at the players that you work with, and that makes all the difference. Probably it, it makes them. all the difference in the world. It, it it's one hundred percent. It's it's something that pretty much stands. Pat, it, it, that doesn't change, and uh, you know, I, I've just, you know, like I said, it, it's been inspiring, and it's. I, I hope that it's inspiring for young people, you know, to to see players that aren't afraid to express their faith, their Catholicism. It's uh, it's good to see. It's good for young kids to see, and. Hopefully. Because athletes, uh, whether they're deserved or not, can become role models. Right, right. So it's what kind of a role model they're going to be. Right. You know. So it's 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 been a journey, that's for sure. Carl, thank you thank for joining you. us on the journey home. Thank you for sharing your story, and God bless you in your continued work in that great sport. And even as we anticipate now, who will be in that. At World Series this year, right? I'm picking Dodgers Houston World Series. All right, well, we'll see. see. How close I get. Well, all right, Carl. Thank, thank you, you very much. God, God bless, bless you, you, my friend. And thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. I do pray that Carl's journey is an encouragement to you. God bless you. Please stay tuned. After a short break, we'll return with an encore episode of The Journey Home that originally aired in 2001 with former Major League Baseball Commissioner Bowie Kuhn. and welcome to The Journey Home. Every week on this program, I have the great privilege to introduce to you men and women who, for their love of Jesus Christ, follow Him wherever He calls, and some with great surprise brings them back to the Catholic Church. Some never been Catholics are drawn to the Church. Others who were Catholics are drawn away, and then by God's grace, they're awakened, sometimes with a very heavy two by four, and then they recognize the journey back. My guest this evening is one whose journey never left the church, but his message to us is that we must never presume. We must never presume. The old spiritual writers told us that in the ways of God, he who does not progress loses ground. We must never presume on our faith. We must always grow. We must all be converts. We must all choose our Lord Jesus. And my guest is one who is well known to all of you, Bowie Kuhn, Commissioner of Baseball at one time. Uh, I'm thinking right now as we do this program, my father probably knows you more than I do in a, in a sense because you are of the same generation and he probably followed your career when I was a young man. And he's here to tell us about his journey of faith. And there's, in fact, there's one part of his journey that reminds me of a of a statement that Paul once, the Apostle Paul once made to Timothy. When he re told Timothy, remember who taught you the faith. 
remember who taught you the faith. And we will talk a bit about who taught him the faith and because of their commitment, the seeds that that planted in his life. You're an important part of the program, so call us if you would at 1-800-221-9460, or you can send us an email at journeyhome at EWTN.com. Bowie, welcome to the program. Thank you, Marcus. What a privilege <coughs> to sit here with you. You're right. I back. just heard of you from afar back when I followed the Detroit Tigers and was hearing how you were making sure that the whole baseball uh, environment uh, it was a good environment, and of course that got you in trouble, didn't it? Well, it got you in a lot of trouble. <laughs> I, I was there for uh, 16 years. It, you know, looking back, it hardly seems possible that 16 years of my life was in, uh, in the role of commissioner. Uh, it, was, it was a fascinating time. It was tough. Um, the baseball is, the, I, I think, the most demanding of all sports. Mm. It's the most contentious of all sports. It grew up as a very contentious sport. Uh, and so the commissioner's caught in, in contention all the time between the owners and other owners, between the owners and players and so forth and so on. And the fans and the media. The expectation of the fans. Yeah. And, uh, and for me it was, uh, yeah, for me it was a great opportunity uh, not only to have a wonderful job. I mean, I love <laughs> baseball. Uh, get to uh, sit up front all the time, I right? Sit, I could sit up front, <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I thought maybe it was better if I didn't, but I could sit up front. And I had a wonderful time, but it, it gave me a great opportunity, it gave me a great platform. Yeah. Because as commissioner, you know, it, uh, you were one of the best known people in the United States. Yeah. That's not Bowie Kim, that's the commissioner of baseball that's always one of the that's best right. known people in the United States. And therefore, I had the opportunity to stand for things and mm -hmm. try to set some kind of standards that people would respect. And they were my Christian standards. You know, they, they grew from my love of Jesus Christ. They, uh, for me, the game had to be a game of rectitude. It had to be a game of integrity. And I never hesitated to say it had to be those things. The first commissioner, Judge Landis, uh, who wasn't a particularly religious man, saw it that way. I saw it that way, not only because Landis had done it that way, and I thought baseball set a great example for the public, mm. but I did it because of my own faith. I said, mm. you've got the platform. You better be an apostle. You better get out there and say something. You, you can't sit silent. You've got to stand for something. And I did, and mm -hmm. I, I got in a lot of trouble. <laughs> well, you know, we, we were talking about what our theme might be for the program, and we were, we were joking that that very well-quoted phrase by uh, Yogi Berra, you know, it ain't over till it's over, right? Um, which points to the fact that I mean, baseball has so many um, images and metaphors and the idea that when your opponent has a great second inning and now you're down nine to nothing uh, and you're heading into the third, well, you, the game doesn't stop with the third inning. You've still got six innings, seven innings to go. And so in, in many ways, baseball is very much like life because it, 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 it encourages never to give up hope. I think you can have a great fourth inning. And I think that's right. Uh, and I think that uh, one of the uh, great presumptions against Hope is believing you can't. Uh, maybe that's the greatest sin, believing you can't, despair. So nine to nothing, no, you're not beaten. Uh, or if you're head nine to nothing, incidentally, yeah. you talk to a baseball man, and, you, and you know, I used to do this, I'd say, oh God, you're up nine to nothing, you're, you're making a mess of this wonderful attraction we got on national television, not that you're gonna do anything about it, you understand. <laughs> and, they, and, he, and they'll always say, we wanna be ahead 20 to nothing. There's never enough. And so I think it does inspire the thought that uh, you know you're not beaten until they yeah. ring the last bell. And you get nine to nothing, kick your feet up. Hey, we got a beat, and before you know it, hey, you can have a great second inning, but so can the other team. Of course, do turn around, do the of same course. thing. And Never give up. Very much about life. Well, if we would, as we used to do in a journey home, let's have you begin talk about your early spiritual journey and what got you started. Well, I um, I was brought up in the city of Washington D.C. I'm one of those rare people who is a native of Washington D.C. I love that city, love it to this day. They didn't have a baseball team anymore for me to love, so I'm a Red That's Sox true. fan. How many times did it change there? I mean, it was the centers. twice. They had two they had two expansion teams mm -hmm. come into Washington. Both of them left. One went to Minnesota and became a world champion in short order, and the other one went to Texas. Mm -hmm. And after that, there were no more Washington Senators. I attended the first Washington Redskins game ever played. I hate to tell you when, it was 1937. <laughs> I loved the Redskins, so my tie in, in a sports sense to Washington is, is the Redskins, uh, who I'm dedicated to. But I grew up in Washington. I was fortunate to have um, 
a trio of ladies around me who are really dedicated mm -hmm. Catholic women uh, who love the Lord very much. And they were my two grandmothers, yeah. one an old German lady uh, who was a, an immigrant to this country, mm -hmm. carrying my father. My father was a native-born German, and she carried in her, in her arms to this country in mm -hmm. 1893, 1894 actually, beginning of 94. And my maternal grandmother, who was a Marylander going back to the Ark and the Dove, as old oh. as you can get, and Catholic. Catholic. The Catholics who, who in the, the Ark and Dove is 1634, so now you're in the, in the reign of Charles I, and, and you have the coming of, the, uh, of Cromwell and the Roundheads mm -hmm. and all those problems, and mm -hmm. a lot of Catholics, they'd they already had plenty of trouble with the Tudors. Now they're having trouble with the Stuarts, and they're getting out of England. So my grandmother is part of that strain of oh. Catholics that came to Maryland, the first uh, religious free state in this country. Uh, free area wasn't the state yet, and so she is. She was a Catholic, mm -hmm. and a proud Catholic. I mean, a really proud Catholic, going back to the beginning of that uh, that landing and oh. uh, the beginning of Maryland. So I, I had these these very devout women who who love the Lord, who uh, my mother and the two grandmothers, who uh, they sort of they were my guardian angels. You know, I had one, I had a guardian angel up here. His name is Tom, and if you want to meet him, he's right there. But they were helping him. So. And so I, I had a I have a wonderful childhood in the church. I love the church, and you know I I was a good kid. I uh, you know I did all the things that a good kid ought to do. I I got all the sacraments of the church. I attended church regularly. I went to confession. I went to communion, and I was a proud Catholic kid. Like my grandmother, I was a proud Catholic kid, and. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's how I began. Strong Catholic environment. We talk about school. No, and not area. a strong Catholic environment. I always okay. went to public schools. Right. Uh, Washington, in those days, had the best public schools. They were arguably the best public schools in the United States. I had a wonderful education in the public schools. Never went to a Catholic school. I don't know why to this day. I was never sent to a Catholic school except to Sunday school. And yeah. There they were puzzled by a kid named Bowie. Where'd you get that name? <laughs> I had a terrible time with an old nun who thought that was a mighty strange well, name I, for I a good Catholic. I thought asking where that name came from. It is. I was, I was actually christened George, but mother tucked in a bunch of Maryland names to make it clear I was a Marylander. You see, Bowie is a Maryland name. Okay. <laughs> and so forth. So I, you know, I had this uh, wonderful upbringing in, in, in Washington, and then time went by, and. Uh, after I became a scoreboard boy for the Washington Senators, and then okay. I became the chief scoreboard boy for the Washington Senators, <laughs> World War II. And mm -hmm. when I was 17 years old, I went in the Navy. So this ends one phase of my my uh, my Catholic walk, mm -hmm. and it was a good beginning. And now I really had a change, and it was just the change that happens, I guess, to 17-year-old kids, particularly when they get out of their home environment. Yeah. Uh, my, you know, my home environment was very good. Actually, the, the environment I grew up in was largely a Protestant environment. Uh, my mother had, a, had an Episcopal father and a Catholic mother, and the people around us, our relatives, were mostly Episcopalians. So I, I grew up in a very heavy uh, mm. Protestant environment, which probably was one of the reasons I, I was sort of a feisty Catholic. You know, I, <laughs> I was going to stand for, for the Lord. and. So, but when I got in the Navy, things changed. That, mm -hmm. that for me was, uh, I left behind my three uh, yeah. great ladies, and uh, and uh, in the Navy, uh, you know, I just began, I, I didn't stop being a Catholic, not in, in any normal sense of that, but in my mind, looking back on it, I stopped being a Catholic, because I wasn't, I quit going to communion, I quit going to confession, I went, to, never missed church, never missed church. Mm -hmm. Uh, wherever I was, I'd find a church and I'd go to it as if I were a faithful Catholic, but that was only a, was a symbolic uh, So the faith pride. side. It was pride. Kind of it was pride. Yeah, okay. I'm going to go to church because I'm a Catholic, see. Uh, but I knew in my heart I wasn't a very good one at that mm -hmm. point. I had drifted away. You know, I lived a high life and uh, went to law school, went to college, went to law school. I went to Princeton, which really was not renowned for its for its Catholicism. That's right. Uh, Presbyterian. Presbyterian, right? That's right. In its founding, and had had been presidented by a long line of Presbyterian ministers mm -hmm. uh, up until the time. I think of Woodrow Wilson. I think he was the first president who was not a Presbyterian minister. But Princeton wasn't pres very Presbyterian by That's that time. Right. Certainly yeah. isn't today. That's right. Um, the Catholics were not permitted to celebrate mass in the in the chapel where the Protestants could have mm -hmm. their services. The Catholics were given Alexander Hall, and there they, there they would say Mass. Well, that sounds like 
something that wasn't so good. But actually, it, I loved it. You know, we, we, we were singled out. We were made something special. And the kind of person that I am just loved that. Mm -hmm. uh, we weren't just run of the mind. We were, we were set apart. And mm -hmm. we had to go to our own place. We couldn't use their place. Today, the Catholics are welcome in the chapel in Princeton, but nobody uses it much. Yeah, it's a um, changed school. Which, it's a changed school. Uh, and that's too bad. But so I went through this drift. You know, I wasn't a bad person. But I certainly was a lukewarm Catholic mm -hmm. and ready to be spit out. Uh, for sure. Yeah. Um, so that, that was you know, a period of 12 years of my life. And uh, mm. then the, the wonders of the sacrament of marriage. I married a wonderful uh, Episcopalian uh, named Louisa, the love of my life. And that was 45 years ago this right? year. Congratulations. Uh, that's an applause line usually <laughs> when I give speeches. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> and, um, well, she wasn't a Catholic. She was a very Christian person, a very dedicated Christian person, is to this day. Thinks the greatest man in the world is John Paul II, incidentally. Mm. Um, not me, John Paul II. <laughs> and, um, well, he is certainly a pope that so many outside the Catholic Church true, respect. Absolutely true. Deeply. And, I mean, I, I, with what I do today, I wander around the country and I talk to people. I, I like to speak at the Right to Life dinners and Right to Life events where you get a great mixture of, right. of c Christian people, evangelicals, mm -hmm. mainline Protestants, Catholics, uh, supporting the <coughs> pro-life cause. So I find myself with those people all the time, and I love them, and I love their dedication to life. And um, so, and they love the Pope. I mean, well, I, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't say that if every last one of them does, I'm sure that's not true, but in general, when I get up and speak, publicly. I get up and I talk the message of a Roman Catholic who believes in Jesus Christ mm -hmm. and a Roman Catholic who believes in the importance uh, of, the, the, of the Pope and in particular the importance of this Pope who I think is one of the seminal figures of the church and one of the great prophets of the church mm -hmm. in its history, mm -hmm. I think is this man. And I preach that. I, and I was, when I say preach, I mean preach. I preach. Mm -hmm. And I've gone to uh, gatherings where where there are more evangelicals than Catholics, and I begin to hear the amens. Yeah. And I love it. I just love it. Well, I think he's probably a mystery to many of them. They, they see his deep commitment to Christ. Exactly. His commitment to Scripture. Exactly. All of that. And so there's this mystery because yet, but he's Catholic. Yeah. So there's there a little yeah, mystery. That's right. And I, I think, I, I, I really think that the, the problems the Catholic Church has with some of our bro Protestant brothers are largely ignorance, nothing more. Right. Exactly. And this man is such a devout lover of Jesus Christ. Everything springs from Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And uh, they respect that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it was marriage that changed my life, Marcus. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so again, it's a woman in yeah, my life, interesting. Uh, my wife. And so I, I, I went right back to the church. I went right back to all the things I did the way I used to do it when I was a kid. Uh, back to church, back to the sacraments, all of that, I, I, all of that. Uh, making some progress along uh, the road, but still not thinking as I would later on in my life, that what I'm here for is to be a saint. Yes. It had never crossed my mind mm -hmm. to think Bowie Kuhn is going to be a saint. I don't think it crossed anybody else's mind. <laughs> uh, and while I was in baseball, I'm sure there were a lot of people. Or maybe in Navy, too. <laughs> <laughs> right, you're in the Navy, right. So, I, but, you know, I was good, uh, but there was another level that I wanted somehow to get to, I was being led to. If I didn't understand, I had to get there. The Spirit was telling me, little by little, I had, I had to get there. So that was sort of phase three. One, my, my childhood, two, the Navy, three, and, and, and you know, going to school and law school and all that, practicing law as a young lawyer. And then marriage, children, four children, got nine grandchildren today. Um, that's an apostolate. And, but 30 years go by sort of more or less like this. I become commissioner of baseball. It gives me a great platform, as I said before, mm -hmm. and, and I, I think I used it. Uh, by hindsight, I should have used it more, but I think I used it. And people, I think, always, when they try to characterize <clears throat> my time as commissioner, they, they talk about his standing for integrity, integrity, integrity. Well, that was part of what I yeah. was doing, but that was that phase of my life. And then uh, just about 30 years after I was married, uh, I'd, I've left the commissionership. I just left it. I'd gone back to practicing law in New York. 
I hadn't yet focused on the fact that when, when Jesus says scribes, Greek lawyers, incidentally, <laughs> it's almost invariably followed by the word woe. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'd gone back to practicing law. He uses viper's brood at another time. Viper's won't go brood, there. that's <laughs> right, that's right. Uh, uh, and I'd been back for a year practicing law in New York when a priest arrived in my office. I didn't know him. I didn't know the name. My secretary said, he's a priest. He wants to see you. I said, are you sure he's a priest? And she said, yes. <laughs> She's a nice Italian girl. She understood the difference. <laughs> And uh, I said, show him in. And his name, well known to people on this network, was Father John McCloskey, a priest of the Opus Dei. Yeah. And he had decided, I don't know why, <laughs> to this day I don't know why, that I needed him. And uh, he is to this day my spiritual director. And it was at that point <clears throat> that my life really took on, my spiritual life took on a new dimension. Uh, and, and I. I think a better dimension, a higher dimension. Um, in that, for the first time, I really became convinced that unlikely as it might seem, implausible as it might seem, that Bowie Kuhn ought to be a saint. Mm. Somehow or other, figure it out, Bowie. Go out there and try to be a saint. You may fail, mm. uh, but the Lord never knocks you down for the good effort. Go out there and try, and you, you're supposed to end your life being a saint. So that was that was the next stage. <laughs> Let's, especially thinking about those who are outside the Catholic Church that are watching, what does it explain more about what it means that we are called to be a saint? And they might think uh, that your goal is to have your name in uh, the Butler's Book of Life, you know, as if that's what it means to be a saint. Yeah. Uh, and and connected with that, I think is this idea of to him who is given much, much is required. And you were given a platform. God gave you great opportunities. Your name is a household name. You have opportunities. Some use that for themselves, but yet there's a better way to use those gifts. Connected with called to be a saint. Talk about that. Well, in, in the first place, I think being called to be a saint is, is, is really a comfortable notion for almost <clears throat> any dedicated Christian because we're called to keep the word. He who keeps the, if he keeps the word, I will come and my father will come. We will, we will, we will live with him. We will, we will eat with him. We will live within him. Mm -hmm. The concept of the Trinity living within us, the Holy Spirit uh, living within us. We usually talk about the Holy Spirit, I guess. That idea began to come into my mind a lot more clearly than it ever had before. That I could be a temple of Jesus Christ. That I could. It, it, how could this be? I, but it could be. And a, a saint is somebody with whom the Lord can dwell, can dwell in his soul, and where the Lord can be comfortable there uh, and not be driven out, not be driven out of that interior castle that St. Teresa talked about, not be driven out, but it would be clean, a, a beautiful place where the Lord could live. That notion of, of the indwelling Lord is the one that I focus on most yes. often as I, as I think, maybe I can be a saint if I always remember that in my soul mm. is the Lord. Mm. And He's not going to stay there unless I behave and keep His Word. Th then, then I have a chance to There's do that. There's that wonderful term uh, that Jesus uses about abiding in me and I in you. Yes. Abiding. Yes. Home. Yes. It's home. Yes. Making this is home. That, that's right. And, and as you're describing it, that that our tendency is to grasp for ourselves, and we're called in your description is to let go, to, to, to let God work through us, That's to come right. into us. And the more we grasp, and there's always that tendency for the rest of our life. Times we want to grasp, no, we got to trust. That's right. We want to grasp. And, and, and Marcus, now, now if the Lord dwells in your soul, and if you have achieved uh, that. Francis de, St. Francis de Sales calls it the state of complacence, hmm. where you finally realize that he loves you. Hmm. you, you a great many of us, even well-intended Christians, you know, he can't really love me, I'm not worth <laughs> it. But when you finally grasp the notion that this infinite love is pouring at you, but maybe not being absorbed, and when you finally through self-giving open yourself up to that love and that love then fully enters into you, 
then you have achieved what, what St. Francis calls complacence. All the great saints, or many of the great saints, had a description of this. And you have this tremendous explosion of love that now exists within you uh, from, from God. Um, and, and that sweeps you along. Now, you're not going to stay on the railroad track all the time. You're like the great <laughs> chariot of Chesterton. You're going to wobble and, and shudder here and there, but you're going to hopefully stay on the track if you realize yeah. what, you, what you have here. So that is the, uh, that plus the, the focusing on, um, by, my, by me on Matthew uh, 25. Uh, to me, uh, Matthew 25 is just stunning. I, 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 for most of my life, I really didn't focus on it. I mean, I knew what it said. I really hadn't focused on what it meant in terms of Bui Kuhn. But when I began to realize that what that was saying to me was that you've got to do something. If this faith is worth a nickel that you've got, then it's got to manifest itself in the love that you give to the people around you. And if you don't do that, that's a sterile faith. Hmm. You've got to do that. And so wherever you look out there in the world, you see the face of Jesus Christ, particularly in the suffering. This yeah. um, Mother Trace of Calcutta was, was, was a great example of this concept, seeing the face of Christ in everybody. That is what changed, that's, that, cha that caused in my life a change from being a guy who went along doing, trying to do the right things and, and, and receiving the sacrament of the church and being a pretty good sacramental Catholic to one who then tried to work his way through the obligations that were imposed on me because a lot had been given to me. I'd yeah. not only been the commissioner of baseball, I was a well-known name. I still, in some circles, right. I don't know how much. I, that's, I, they still stop me in airports and talk to me, but <laughs> uh, I, could, I could use that. So now, what I do today is I use it, and I use it all over the country. I, in, in, I work for colleges, I work for universities, I go and make, anybody invites me to come speak, I don't charge anything. I shouldn't say this. But, um, <laughs> the phones are already ringing off the hall. <laughs> you know, I pay my expenses and I'll be there if it's a good Christian cause, or if, even if it's a good, decent public cause, I'll be there, and I will try to do what I can to be helpful. I'm trying to be a saint, so watch out, here I come. But that's, in evangelization, that's often the hardest part about evangelization is getting your foot in the door to get people to hear you. Well, God gives someone an opportunity, and then sadly, pride gets in the way, and we get that opportunity and use it for ourselves, use it to make money, use it to, uh, to try and make a name for ourselves, recognizing, forgetting to recognize that, no, that's a foot in the door given to you by God. Yes. It's an opportunity it's, to get His it's, name. It's an invaluable <laughs> opportunity. I've been given it, and I'm, I'm eternally thankful for it, and I'll tell you something else. I have a wonderful time carrying out this. You see, before all time, he gave you a mission, he gave me a mission, he gave everybody out there right. a mission. And this, I know what his mission is, at least I think I know. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to carry out what I think that mission is. And they say, woe unto the guy who on the, on the last day appears before the Lord, and, and he says, How'd you do your mission? And he said, well, I never figured out what it was. Don't ever get, don't ever yeah. get in that position. Yeah. How about in conclusion? talk about how your journey of faith, as always a Catholic, but as a growing and sometimes struggling Catholic, how this whole thing has draw, brought you closer to Jesus? Well, it certainly has. Um, you know, you know I, I will give you an example. When I was a younger, I would never go to somebody and say, I believe in Jesus Christ. <laughs> I, I couldn't do it. I mean, I, I mean, I did. I, I mean, I did believe in Jesus Christ, but it wasn't my way. Yeah. Uh, to go out and say, uh, say that. Some years ago, when I really got into, began to get into heavy duty public speaking because I'd let it be known that I'd be, I'd be available, um, they invited me to come to Steubenville and speak at one of the Steubenville conferences. It's the first talk I ever gave to a conference. I've given many since, a men's yeah. conference. I loved it. And I tried to figure out how I would open it, how I would convince these people that an old baseball commissioner and lawyer at that, you know, whoa, uh, had anything worth saying. And my opening line was, I tried to, exp I tried to say to myself, why am I here? What, how can I tell you why I'm here? And it came to me in the middle of the night, I'm going to tell you why I'm here. I'm here because I'm madly in love with Jesus Christ. The whole place stood up. The whole place stood up. 
Um, that's an example, uh, Marcus, uh, but for me, that is where I've been taken. We thank you very much for joining us. It's a great pleasure. Thank you for your witness and all that you do. God bless you in that. Thank you. Thank you for joining us in the Journey Home. It's always a pleasure to introduce guests to you that you've heard all the time but maybe didn't know the extent of their faith and love for Christ. So thank you. I'll see you again next week.